Chamberlain embodied the title of the book because on one side he was a college professor, an intellectual, a gentle man in every sense of the word, and yet he was going to lead men into battle, and the object of the battle is to kill the other guy. Now, Chamberlain was a very demanding role to cast because he embodied in his persona the title of the book. The project in those days was still called The Killer Angels. When you're at the Battle of Gettysburg, you're not in the business of persuading somebody through rhetoric, which was his way he was trained. You're persuading somebody at the end of a bayonet or a gun. You needed somebody who could bring that scholarly, professorial personality, but also bring the bloodlust of a killer, the way soldiers have to kill. They're not killing because they want to, or if they enjoy it. I mean, there are sadists in all wars, but that wasn't Chamberlain. It wasn't my father in World War II. My father went in World War II. He was a gentleman, too. He was a, I have his books. So that was Chamberlain. And yet we needed a name person. So if you looked at the names who were available in the right age, the right look, the right quality, again, who looked like they were in America in the 19th century. So I heard from a friend, they said, there's this actor who comes, he just came over, he's been here about six months from Australia, he's done some films in Australia, but you should meet him, he's an interesting guy. So uh, he came up to my house, I had a, a, a place in uh, Hidden Hills, and he came and he read for me, uh, and I was really impressed. I said, it's gonna be tough because totally unknown guy. Never done any work in the United States, but this is my Chamberlain. So I guess I said, I said, listen, you need to uh, come back in a few days, learn these two soliloquies. As we know, there are soliloquies in my movies. It's part of the tradition, the classical tradition, which some people don't like. Oh, a guy gives a whole speech, you know. You know, there's always a snide comment, you know, like. Uh, even the dogs have speeches in Ron Maxwell's film, or, or the horse had a speech. Or, you know, I, I read all the, you know, the jokes. Uh, but it, again, it's deliberate, it's conscious, uh, and it derives from the material, it derives from the characters. In the case of Gettysburg, which, as we know, really adheres very closely to the novel, Gods and Generals doesn't. It it's takes, takes enormous liberties from the novels, but, but Gettysburg adheres very closely to it, and the second main uh, the speech of the second main is verbatim as Michael Shower wrote it. Now there are other speeches in, in Gettysburg which I wrote, which are not in the book, like, like when uh, Armistead is talking to Fremantle before Pickett's Charge, that's not in the book. That's my edition, and there's a few like that, so there's both. So uh, I told this actor, I need you to, these, these two scenes, the scene when he talks to the second main, and the scene when he's talking to Kilrain, I think it was the scene when he's talking to Kilrain about slavery and about looking into the eye of a person you see there's a man there's a spark there's a man i said i need to do those come back i'm going to film you the way we're filming now and i'm going to get a blue uniform for you we're going to do a screen test because they want me to have a name and they're going to i'm going to get blowback so i got to show them but so a few days later he came back and i had my little video camera back in the day with did a little videotape in it before digital and um in my backyard, I, I did the screen test. So I brought it in to the head of production at the time at TNT. Remember, this is when we thought we were making a miniseries, not a movie. The name was Alan Sabinson. And uh, I showed him the video. He said, why are you showing me this? I said, well, look, it speaks for itself. He said, I told you I want a name for this. So why are you wasting my time? I said, w w why do we need to keep looking? This this is Chamberlain. We need a name for Chamberlain. Now, I found it strange at the time because we weren't making a theatrical film. A theatrical film, you need names to open the first weekend. But when you're doing something for a television miniseries, yeah, you need names, but not as, you're not at risk the way you are when you're doing a theatrical film. But I'm not going to argue with him. So I called back his agent, who was at the time at CAI. I think it's still the same agent. And I explained the situation, I said, but wait, hang in with me. Uh, I'm not gonna give up on this. So a few more weeks went by, I didn't see anybody else for Chamberlain. And I kept on looking for Buford, I kept on I met, had a meeting with Tom Berenger about playing Longstreet. I kept on looking for Lees. 
and I kept him with the other casting. A couple weeks went by, and uh, Saban said, what's going on with Chamberlain? I said, well, you know, I've thought about it. I've looked around. I, I think we should really consider this guy. And he said to me, if you mention his name one more time, I am canceling this picture. Now, remember, I didn't know. I couldn't get the, the phone to, to, uh, with Ted Turner, so I thought that could be serious. And after 15 years, it, wherever, however long it was at that point, 13, 12 years, I wouldn't have a project. So he says, so you mentioned his name one more time, I'm canceling the picture. The name of that actor was Russell Crowe. I can't tell you how typical this is. Let the story speak for itself about how smart some of these production executives are. This is the life of a filmmaker. Well, okay, it worked out. Then I, kept, then I was forced to keep looking. And um, anyway, I called back his agent, Mr. Freeman. And, uh, and I said, I'm sorry this didn't work out, you know, but I tried. I, I told him what I just told you. I said, if I bring his name up, they're going to cancel the project. <laughs> oh, boy. Then about, you know, a few months later, he went on to make, start his Hollywood career. And the rest is, as we say, history. So well, Jeff Daniels' name came up in the conversation as being in that rarefied group who has the gravitas, all these qualities I'm talking about. He had, he had just come off a couple of big movies where uh, he, he, he was already a big star and, and getting bigger. He was just what they wanted at TNT, that kind of name. So we got in touch with him. We sent him this, the script, and, and the word came back. He really was interested and wanted to do it, but he wanted to have a meeting. So, so it was a mutually subject to a meeting is how it goes. He's not going to read for me. He's not going to audition. And by coincidence, I had seen him on stage because he, he did work for the Circle Rep in New York, and I had seen him in plays when I was working at NET in the 1970s. He was in a play or two, I think, by Lanford Wilson, if my memory can serve me right. And he still had a theater company outside of Detroit. So we arranged for me to meet him uh, at his theater company. So I, I, got, I was going to see his play that he had directed, a new play he directed, and then afterwards we were going to go have a beer together. So I saw the play, uh, and then we went uh, to a local... Uh, uh, watering hole and we were having this cordial conversation and I leaned over to him and I said Jeff you read the script uh, I know you've done great films you've worked with great directors I know what you, and I saw you on stage we didn't know each other back there so I know what you can do but in all the work you've done I've seen the side of you that can be the professor I've seen the intellectual. I've seen that in many movies. What I've never seen is the killer side. I've never seen the steel required when Joshua Chamberlain is in it the second day on Little Round Top and he orders men to battle. I just need you to say, look me in the eye and tell me that you can deliver the steel. And he got totally focused, and he said, I'll show you the f***ing steel, but what I want to know from you is do you have the steel to shoot this f***ing script and not to get backed off and compromised and have it watered down and having scenes cut out of it? Do you have the f***ing balls to shoot this f***ing script? He said it just like that. And we had what was known as a male bonding experience. We shook hands and we committed to each other in that moment. Now here's where the story gets good. Months later, we're on the set and the second half of the shoot is now the Yankees. Confederates are gone, wrapped, all gone home. And we get out to the scene, the second main scene, when he's delivering the speech to the second main mutineers. And the light's low. It's like we like the light low because it's a beautiful light, backlit. And uh, we shoot it. And you, you, you're, when you talk about this cast we had, whether you're talking about Jeff Daniels or Tom Berenger or uh, any of the actors we had in any of these Civil War movies, these people are at the top of their game. These are great actors. So you're never in the, in the realm of right and wrong, good and bad. You're, you're here. 
you're professionally competent, very good, to inspired. So what I'm looking for is inspired. I don't want just professionally good, competent. I want inspired. And they're all capable of it if the stars line up right. And um, so I have a very, very high, very high bar when, when I'm shooting, especially those scenes, the scenes like this. I hope the high bar is all the time, action, whatever it is, but it's especially high in those scenes. When Chamberlain's talking to Kilrain about slavery, when Chamberlain's talking to the second main about their mutiny, it's the heart and soul of the movie. You, 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 not only do you have to get it right, you gotta hit it out of the park. So, take one was very good, then I, I never give actors directions like, even as loud as we're talking now. I get right up close, and I'm almost whispering to them. Because it's so intimate, what you're talking about. You're talking about such fragile parts of the human psyche that you want to do something that opens them up, not closes them down. So if you talk, if you talk loud so everybody in the crew can hear it, you're going to create a human being to be defensive. The last thing in the world I want them to be. I don't want them being defensive. They're not performing for the crew or the cameraman or for the script girl. They're, I want them to be the person, the role. I want them to be in the 1860s. So I go up and whisper, talk, and we can make a short brief. But, and, and these actors are so good, one or two words is all you have to say. They get it. So basically what I told them is we need to go again. Because we didn't hit this point, we didn't hit that point. I mean, it's not that he missed anything, but there's more there. You can't leave anything, you can't leave anything on the table on when you get to these scenes. And these actors can do it. And when you tell them that, they, they soar. That's what they want to hear. They don't want to hear, oh, wonderful, pat on the back, that's great, next scene. They know better. What? Jeff Daniels had already worked with great directors by this time. Their standards are high. So we did it again. Also very good. But the light was now low. We couldn't go a third time. I knew we didn't get it. I knew we didn't get where I wanted. So I said, Jeff, we need to go again. We got to wait till tomorrow, 24 hours later, late in the afternoon. And he, uh, he understood. I wasn't telling him, you're not good enough. He understood. We didn't nail it. So we wrapped for the day. And I went to my producer partners, uh, Makti and Bob, and I said, we got to put this back in the schedule for tomorrow and then readjust the schedule. And they were all scared to death about losing a half a day on the schedule. And again, I'm aware of the schedule, but I'm not obsessed by it. You can't be driven by it. So uh, they said it was a bad idea. They said, well, let's look at the dailies before we make that decision. I said, we don't have time to look at the dailies. And, I, and, I, and anyway, I said, I don't need to look at the dailies. I was there. I'm telling you, I'm the director. We need to go again. There's no, we don't need to look at the dailies. If you look at the dailies, you'll see a very good performance but it's not the performance I want. So they're pushing me back, pushing me back. So um, there was another uh, representative of TNT on the set, uh, the, the, the corporate guy, the business guy. And he said, we, we, uh, uh, I'm putting my foot down. We can't, we can't uh, add a half a day to the schedule. So I went to Jeff. I called Jeff uh, Daniels and Kevin Conway, who played Kilrain, and see Thomas Howell, who played his brother, into the motorhome. I told him what was going on. Uh, and I said, uh, this is not acceptable to me. Is it acceptable to you? They just wanted to wrap it. No, we have it. They said, we have it. So Jeff said, well, call him into my, my, call him into my motorhome. So this is the end of the day. Uh, and I, I called um, the executive from TNT who said we, we couldn't do it again. Into the motorhome with me. Jeff Daniels, Kevin Conaway, and C. Thomas Howe. And Jeff Daniels said, I have a contract that I signed. It's sitting in my agent's office in Los Angeles. And it said that I would shoot this script with this director. So if we don't reschedule this scene tomorrow, I'll be on a plane first thing in the morning back to Los Angeles. Kevin Conway said, I'll be in, in my car going back to New York. And see Thomas Howell said, now I'll be on a plane going to Los Angeles. So let us know what you want to do. That executive had a screaming fit. He was throwing things around in the motorhome. 
breaking things. They just sat calmly. And then he finally left. And then, and then the word came back, we were going to shoot the scene next day. And I tell this story because we went back the next day, and on the very first take, Jeff Daniels nailed it. And that's the take that's in the movie. And we didn't go over schedule. We finished the movie on the end of the 62nd day. So Jeff Daniel came through with his part of the bargain we made in Ann Arbor, and so did I. <laughs>